Hey everyone, this is Ross Raddy and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about figs, we talk a lot about fruits, vegetables, things you've probably never heard of, uh, and how to grow that. And also some other tips in, in the kitchen for what you should do after you harvest. So in this episode, I want to show you guys a couple things, uh, some things that are going on. We're going to get to a, a viewer's question at the end of this. Um, We've been doing some mapping of the orchard, some planning. I'm going to talk about how to grow figs indoors. And uh, let's get started. So the first thing I want to mention is that I'm immensely proud of the new website that I've created. And I've done this through Weebly.com and this is a free, it's a free website, you know. Um, I don't have to pay for hosting, but the part of that that, you know, the, the kind of the catch is they have to have Weebly in the name of your of your website, so it's it's rossratty.weebly.com. Unfortunate, but you know I'm not willing to put in the uh, the extra little cash there just to get a domain name. It, it doesn't seem worth it to me. I'm totally fine with with Weebly in the name, but you can see here on the website, guys. It's oh my god, it looks so beautiful. I love the fonts. I love the layout. I love the the theme. Um, and it's also pretty easy to set up. So if anyone's interested in putting together a website for themselves, it's really not that difficult. Uh, on the home page here, we actually have a blog. And I'm really excited to have a blog because I love to post on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. But on Instagram and Twitter, and actually all three of them, I post at the same time. I'll post the same thing and it goes to each individual one at the same time. It's just a lot less work that way. And on Instagram and Twitter, they're really limiting in how much words you can actually put in there, right? You know, Twitter only limits you to so many characters. And I used to always, when I was only on Facebook and I only had a Facebook page, I would always put out long form content that was worthwhile, I thought. And, you know, it's a lot of valuable information there rather than just a couple little tidbits. And then what ends up happening on Instagram and Twitter, I get all these questions and it's like, well, you know, I could have answered all these questions beforehand if I just had a longer form way of, uh, of conveying what I wanted to say. So on the homepage is a, a blog and we've already posted our first, made our first blog post. It's about growing figs in cold climates, a couple rules that I, I live by and have learned. Uh, we also have a mission statement. We have consulting services. This is probably the most exciting thing for me is because, you know, I really like to help people and I would love to start my own fig orchard, not just in my backyard, but something commercial at some point in the future. And if I can help somebody also do the same thing and get paid for it, oh, that would be incredible. You know, um, uh, it, it really is something that I think a lot of people should be growing more as a commercial crop. You can get a really high profit margin off of these things. And you can grow them in places you probably didn't think you could. So knowing that, I think a lot of farmers, I think a lot of uh, even just home gardeners are going to be growing figs more and more. I see the demand. It's very clear. Um, I think a lot of people, like they had maybe 60 years ago, a lot of people are going to have fig trees nowadays, whether it's in their yard or... I think you're going to see a lot of farmers growing them as well. So I'm offering up my services on the website and it's, uh, you know, if anyone's interested, please contact me. But we've also got a contact form here, a link to the YouTube page, a link to this podcast as well. Um, by the way, we're going to have this podcast on iTunes very shortly. I have an artist that's working on some art for me. Uh, we'll probably have some of that art also featured on the website on the YouTube banner. Everything's going to look so spiffy. I'm so excited. It looks great. Now on to some things that are happening here in my area is that the weather in the in my area is just really not uh, looking that good. We've had a pretty mild winter, but tonight, uh, actually me filming this tonight, we are getting down to eight degrees Fahrenheit here, which is actually pretty, pretty mild for a winter low. Um, and I'm expecting, you know, if we get past this next couple of days without going below that, that's probably going to be the lowest temperature we have all winter, which is really incredible for someone who's in zone seven a, um, that would, I think 
technically then put me in zone 7B, this particular winner. And normally we get to zero. I think that's pretty normal. You get a, we had a couple winners in a row that were pretty extreme, but you know, that's like, that's what I would consider myself as zone 7A, zero degrees to five degrees at the minimum low of the, uh, of the winter time. So now we're kind of going back to like, you know, now I'm in like 7B. It really depends on the winter, but I think it's pretty, pretty hard for me to go below zero into the negatives of Fahrenheit, you know? Um, but we are a little bit worried. We are taking a lot of soil, uh, soil samples, right? We're taking the uh, temperatures of the air and comparing that to the soil. Um, kind of, uh, I'm actually going to go outside and like the crack of dawn it, when it's super cold outside. I'm going to see what the temperatures are in the soil so that I know or have some sort of good idea that if it is zero degrees outside, what the soil temperatures will be like in different areas that I planted my fig trees. All in an effort to raise the the planting site, um, kind of alleviate a lot of that excess water, but also increase the metabolisms of these plants by a ton, right? You know, you, if you plant them up higher, you put, thing, put things in raised beds, you're going to have just a lot more heat, right? The, the earth warms up a lot quicker in the summertime, in the springtime. It's just a, overall a great idea for somebody in a shorter season climate to be doing that, is planting things higher. So um, that's what we're testing, is we're trying to see what the, what the soil temperatures are like tonight. Tomorrow we're going to have a 12 degree low, it looks like. But you know what? Uh, what worries me the most, even though it's only 8 degrees or even 12 degrees, the wind is insane. Uh, it's 15 to, 15 to 20 to, uh, miles per hour right now. It's been like that all day. It's going to be like this all night. Um, and that wind chill is really going to affect these trees probably in a really bad way. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we've, we've also recorded. We've, we've taken lots of samples of different things, lots of data I've collected leading up to this point. I have two trees that were freshly planted that are actually have already died back to the ground and they're going to have to re-sprout from the base. But um, all the other trees are perfectly fine, no damage whatsoever. So we'll see if this wind chill here, this really cold night that we're about to have, what that affects or how that affects some of these fig trees that I have in the ground. And we're going to go out there, I said, like again, we're going to go out there and we're going to take the you know those temperature readings we're going to see what the deal is and a month from now we'll be able to tell what the damage is if any um, that's when you'll see it it takes about a month so on instagram here i made a post uh quite recently actually this weekend i was at my girlfriend's place in the city of philadelphia and she is growing a fig tree that we got her um she's growing this in her apartment and she's got it in a sunny window um, she's got a pretty warm room there and it's, it's growing, it's growing and it's not only is it growing, but it's also putting out figs. So really happy for her. This is the Smith fig. This is one of the best figs you can have. Um, probably also a good one for indoors because it, it doesn't take a whole lot for it to fruit. So I'm excited for her. And you know, a lot of people have been asking me since I posted this, some little bit of information. I think what I'll do is when I go over her place next, I'll bring the camera along. We'll do a little video on it. But for the most part, my recommendations are pretty simple. Get a nice, sunny, warm window. Preferably if you can put the pot in the windowsill, I think that helps a lot because the heat, the sunlight heats up the side of the pot and really gets the metabolism of the fig tree going even more. But also it's really important to have a warm room, okay? Um, you know, you really need a fig tree to be in like 75 or more. Um, you know, most people's homes are not 75 degrees, especially in January, at least in my area. But if you have a room that maybe has a uh, heat, right? You got the nice little heater, you got a shower, right? The shower heats up the room, whatever it is, right? To put it in a position that's gonna be uh, the most beneficial for you. And then what she's gonna do this year, because she hasn't done this yet, but she will put the fig tree outside uh, in, the, in the springtime. So we won't keep it indoors all year, but 
Um, it is getting a really nice head start to the season. Waking up in um, in late January, it should fruit no problem for her this summertime. Um, even if she has like in her backyard, she doesn't really have the most sun. She does have a pretty decently sunny area back there. Um, she's fairly lucky to have a, a backyard sort of in the city, but um, you know it will be enough to get her some pretty high quality fruits. I think. Um, this season, which is really exciting. The last thing I want to mention, well, actually, two more things we want to mention. We gotta, we gotta mention this orchard map here, and then we have one more question. We have a question we're gonna answer at the end of this video, or at the end of the podcast, guys, answering somebody's question that I, I found pretty interesting. But I want to touch on this. We did a video on um, mapping an orchard, right? Um, you know, if you want to have the more finer details on that, go to the YouTube page, check out this particular video of mapping an orchard. I think this is pretty cool. You can use this tool. It's Google Draw, uh, Google Draw. excuse me guys. It's a really nice resource for mapping things out because it's very easy to move them around. You don't really necessarily have to have them in static on paper. You make a, a mess up, you know, you want to move the peaches somewhere else. You want to put this there, you want to put this there, and then you're like, oh, you know what? I don't really like how this is laid out. Let me change this around. You got to start all over. Where this is, you know, all electronic. You know, it's like having an eraser or very easily being able to erase things, move things around. It's very, very simple. I highly recommend it. It's still not done. It's in its beginning phases for those of you who can see the visual that I'm looking at right now. Um, we still have to add a couple more things in here, like, you know, how many things are going to go in each row what the variety is that's going to be in each row and then that way we can label that and have that as a key and we can look at the map anytime we want and know exactly what is where at any time um you know that way you don't necessarily have to have plant tags plant tags are great but you always because you always want to know what it is you're growing what the variety is you need to keep track of that right it's important to know all that stuff so you can keep a tra keep track of your mi in your mind or in a spreadsheet or somewhere you know is this variety performing to my expectations right um so we're going to get into you know finer details i think with this but another way of doing this that i i actually didn't mention in the video we did on youtube is that um you can get like a nice little um gps image of your backyard or your orchard put that in Google Draw and then draw things onto that, right? Have yourself a base image that you guys can use. It's a really nice way of doing it. Google Earth, Google Maps. Um, you can even have a drone, take an overhead photo of it if you have a drone. You know, this is a really, um, I think a really nice way of doing it. It's a must have if you're gonna be planting an orchard, I think. The last thing, again, we're just gonna answer this guy's question on YouTube. Ligs Life asked me, Muscadines question mark don't nice bunch grapes grow up in my area People grow muscadines uh, down here in Florida because most bunch grapes don't do well here And what I think he's referring to is European grapes um, A friend has some rare bunch grapes or or European grapes bed bred for Florida doing amazing giving uh, two of those a try um, so yeah, Lig is, uh, Lig is sort of right here, but he's also sort of wrong because really grapes do not do well in my particular area. Uh, if you go north of me, they probably will because it's potentially less humid the further north you go. But at the same time, you're, you're pushing it a little bit because we have so much humidity. You know, I'm in Pennsylvania. He's in Florida. We're all still in the mid-Atlantic, right? We're all still in this little belt of crazy humidity, right? It even goes all the way out west towards the eastern half of Texas, right? We're all still very humid, right? All those southern states, everything along the east coast, all the way up north is just extremely humid, and that humidity makes it very difficult to grow European grapes. Those are the grapes that we normally see in the stores, even wine grapes that you make wine out of. You know, they're very um, susceptible to disease. And you have to get, and in my situation, I've gotten some varieties that are disease resistant, but 
I don't think it's possible to grow grapes in my climate without spraying at least something, right? And I've chosen this year to really spray for rot. I think that's the biggest thing. We have this product now that I'm going to try. It's not organic, which I'm, I'm really not a fan of, but I'm only going to spray this thing once a year. And it's called Spectricide Immunox. And when the the grapevine wakes up from dormancy, it puts out growth that's about a foot long. Spray the vine with that Spectricide Immunox. Cover that new growth, and it should kill all of the rot on that vine. As the, as the vine is then putting out those clusters of fruit in its very early stages, you will almost completely wipe out the disease, and you won't have to do anything for the remainder of the year. So yeah, if the if the foliage doesn't look as great as it should, you know, that's too bad. But that's kind of the point of the muscadine grape is that the muscadine grape is a southern grape, right? It's meant to be grown and it's really naturalized in the southern United States. So um I have found though what uh, I think Lig's life doesn't really know is that I have found two varieties that you can actually grow further up north and they're called lane and triumph and i've heard good reports of people stating that they have survived negative 10 degrees fahrenheit again me being in zone 7a and this year i'm in zone 7b um you know i'm gonna have absolutely no problem growing those muscadine grapes and they're way better um in the sense that they have no problems with any disease you don't have to spray them you don't have to care for them you just have to protect them from the birds. Um, and they're a nice little late season grape. So the way I see them, and I may have mentioned this before in the podcast, you get um, a form of grape called gooseberry pretty early in the season. I'd say sometime around July in my area. And the gooseberry is pretty similar to a grape. I mean, uh, you know, it's its own fruit, but I would say the texture, the taste is certainly pretty similar to a grape. And then once you get past that and you get into august you get into september you then get the european bunch grapes that you see in the store and then once that's over in uh, you know late september and october you then get the fall grape which is the muscadine grape so we're really getting grapes by doing this but in having muscadine grapes not only are they disease resistant they are um you know really they do really well in my area um, I'm getting successive ripening this way, right? I'm, I'm basically getting grapes all throughout the year, which is phenomenal. And all I have to do is really protect them from the birds and the squirrels. Um, I shouldn't really have any problems with the muscadine grapes and the birds because the birds around August, right around when my, um, my European grapes ripen, after that ends, the birds kind of disappear and I don't see them anymore for the rest of the year. So... Um, I shouldn't have any problem with the birds and the muscadine grapes, but I should maybe worry about the squirrels. We'll see what happens. Uh, definitely need, need to protect your fruit out there, guys. But yeah, that was this episode of Fruit Talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one. And uh, for those of you guys who are watching on the YouTube channel, I'll see you tomorrow. All right? Take care.